<clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the time and the willingness to uh, put another presentation in the record. Um, time is rapidly running out and uh, perhaps our ability to broadcast these messages as well. So we ask that you bless what we're doing. We want the presence of your Holy Spirit. Uh, we want this message to go as the latter rain and as leaves of autumn and ask that you would bless it for that reason and prepare the hearts and minds of those that would hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. At the beginning of 2017, <coughs> we came to understand Paneum. And I want to return to that over the next couple of presentations. But once it was put in the record, we kind of left off. 2017 was the turning point in terms of focus. That's when the, the satanic influence really became active. As you look back at it, you see it. And the direction we should have been going got sidetracked, as I see it. That's my understanding. But I came to understand some things about Paneum, and we're going to start going back in there um, now. And I did it, it came together, it kind of gelled one night, and the next morning I was leaving for some meetings in Canada, and I came here and I told a couple brothers that I thought were sympathetic with what we were teaching. I afterwards found out they were already alienated from our message, working behind the scenes with the soldier um, from Scotland. And I told them what I was seeing about Paneum, and I was kind of amazed that they never seemed that impacted by it. They were obviously wrapped up in this other message that, uh, that the soldier presents. And so we put it in the record, did it a couple times, and then turned away from it. Um, later on, just to try to make some points here, later on when in the end of 2018 when Tess was here and Theodore was here, we recognized that it was 252 days from November 9th, 2019 until July 18th, 2020. And we had these other Islamic symbols to, un to help us understand the significance of July 18th. So I immediately put it in the public record that July 18th would be Paneum. That's just what we did. So the, the development was at the beginning of 2017, we, we went into the story of Caesarea Philippi, where we're heading now in the scriptures, and took what the scriptures, the spirit of prophecy says about it, and then went into history, because Caesarea Philippi has some, some of the most profound history connected with it that you're ever going to find in, in biblical history. And we saw many things connected with um, that story. And some of them is, is based upon the word pan, but not all of them. Okay, one of the things about um, Matthew 16, where the disciples and Jesus are in Paneum, which at that time was called Caesarea Philippi, is I believe that's the second witness to Palmoni. We can, we can speak all we want about Palmoni being the wonderful number, but if we're holding true to our understanding of biblical application, we need to have a second witness uh, that, that Christ, that we, a second point of reference that Christ is the wonderful number. And I'm believing that it's Matthew 16 where we find that. Okay, so it's not just that Paneum was understood in terms of the word pan, but in terms of the word pan, uh, we had Peter Pan, uh, I, I, probably if you're like me, uh, almost 70 years old, grew up in the United States in the time period where Walt Disney uh, puts in the, the movie industry, the movie Peter Pan. I know that I seen that when I was a kid, and I was not a Christian when I was a kid. Um, I don't really remember it, but I've been to Disneyland when I was a kid, and they, they got the ride that's Peter Pan's ride. But I never knew about it knew the truth about Peter Pan until Pan Paneum was opened up. The book about Peter Pan is a very satanic book, and it's about Lucifer's rebellion in heaven, about him leading planet Earth. It's about the great controversy, leading planet Earth into rebellion. Um, and Walt Disney just took it and turned it into a, a cartoon. But once you see the, the, 
the outline of the book, then you can see how satanic that movie was. But okay, Peter Pan. You, you may think that's a, a stretch on the word paneum, but Matthew 16, one of the punchlines, one of the themes of Matthew 16 is the name of Peter. Okay, so you've got paneum in there and you've got Peter. And as Larry showed the other day, Peter in Matthew 16 uh, numerically is the 144,000. So the story of Peter Pan is an, a direct attack against the 144,000. Uh, the temple uh, that's at Paneum is perhaps the most significant New Age satanic temple in human history. Um, in the time of Christ, it was called the gates of hell. So when Jesus said that, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, he was talking about the religion of Pan that was there associated with Paneum, where they were at, which at that time period was called Caesarea Philippi. And, I mean, yeah, that's a big story because that temple was in front of a cave, and in the cave was a... a, a a pool of water that was so deep that most people thought it was a bottomless pool of water, but in reality, that spring that filled that pool in the Temple of Pan is the spring that feeds uh, the Jordan River. And the Jordan River means descender. And where does the Jordan River go? It goes to the Dead Sea. Okay, so what's the Jordan River represent? represents Christ, who descended from the throne of heaven all the way to death. He descended in order to redeem his people. But that river begins right there in the temple of Pan, okay? That's where the, the water comes from, that stream. So it's speaking about the great controversy, the corruption of the message uh, down through history. And the Jordan River is not simply talking about John the Baptist baptizing Christ and saying, He must descend and I must descend. It's not simply that the Jordan River means descend in that regard. It also meant that Christ descended all the way to the Dead Sea, to death, to redeem us. So, Caesarea Philippi, when it opened up, it, it was incredible. I'll, we'll try to get there, but I want to show you some things before we get there. I'm going to go to the notes now. And on your notes, it says the midnight cry. We are in the time period of the midnight cry for the priests. And when we first started grappling with the midnight cry, we did not recognize, or maybe some did, but we didn't put it in the public record, that in the time of the midnight cry, there's a counterfeit midnight cry message. We now recognize that on lots of witnesses. Watertown. Watertown yeah, but when we first recognized the midnight cry, we, we weren't even understanding Millerite history. But I've given a witness to a counterfeit today. What was that earlier? 977, Jeroboam, uh, eighth month, 15th day. Here's a counterfeit worship service on August 15th. Okay. Um, so now we know that, and as we look back, um, when we began to wake up to the Omega apostasy and where we were in the flow of events, we realized that Loughborough had a dream about three pools, and I've made the application shortly after September 7th, and I, any time I look at it, it's just as sound as it was then. Mud those puddles. Mud puddles. Um, those three mud puddles represent the three points, the three way marks where light for the midnight cry arrived. But it always had the corruption, always had a corruption in a of certain human beings. And so I, I want to I review some of those things. But on your notes, under the Midnight Cry, in 2013-14, Ezra 7 9's opened up. I got 2013-14 because there's a lot of things that go on in that history. Not only uh, does uh, the, what was I calling him? Not the soldier. Not the soldier. The rebel? I think I called him the rebel. Pardon me? Revolutionary. The revolutionary. revolutionary. The revolutionary brought Ezra, Ezra 7, 9. Uh, but at that same time period, we had finished Habakkuk's tables. And now we can see, when we look at the line of the beast, the story of Fatima, the external, that the, the real important waymark in the external line for this current pope was March 13th, 2013. 
That's when he becomes Pope. So right there in the same month, the same year, uh, that Parminder is supposedly offended over yeah. his half right, half wrong message not being accepted as 100% right, um, is where the external Pope that is typifying he and his comrade in arms becomes Pope. Okay, so 2013-14, there's lots of things happening there at the beginning, at the arrival of the first of those three pieces of information that come together to make up the Midnight Cry. And then in December 17, 2016, Raffia and Paneum are opened up in Wales. And this is where the soldier announces that the Omega apostasy is here and Future for America is the Omega apostasy. But this is the first time... I mean, I've been, I had been teaching the Omega apostasy for years and years, but this is the first time now that it's, it becomes a, a direct discussion in this movement. And then on October 13, 2018 is where I'm marking the opening up of November 9th. And the reason I'm saying November 9th is this is the, this isn't about Tess's false prophecies about November 9th. This is about the chronology that lays out November 9th. Okay, so um, November 9th is an absolute airtight waymark, and you, and you need to settle into that. It's, been, it's scary for some people to accept that premise after all the foolishness that was attached to it that didn't come to pass, but there's no way around it. it is, it's as solid as any other of these waymarks. We will get to that as we proceed. Were you raising your hand back there? Yeah, I know that the argument against that now is the same argument that the, um, the social justice warriors do. If you accept November 9th, then you have to accept all their pollution they put around it. That's what that, that apostasy is doing. And I see now that social justice warriors do the same thing. If you don't accept, say, deviant lifestyles, then you must hate all those people. And it's that yeah. same logic that's being put in place for November 9th. You have to take all of their debris to accept that date. And it's, it's all just that mindset nothing? of social justice warriors. They, all yeah, that, that, it's that, that mindset. That's, it's a mindset, but that's the argument that I'm making, is that they purposely put that debris there to destroy it. Yeah. And once, once we've now identified that Satan threw them, once we've identified that it's a bunch of foolishness, now their second argument is, is well, you, you either accept all or none. And I'm saying, no, we'll accept it based upon the fact that we're in the history of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And the first time the pilgrims saw the glorious land was on November 9th. Okay, so the starting of the glorious land was on November 9th. And on midnight, November 9th, 1989, the time of the end for this movement began, and 30 years later, at midnight on November 9th, uh, this period of 30 years comes to an end. Just on that alone, in Ezekiel 1, 1, which says, which tells you takes place in the 30th year, go to Ezekiel 1, 1, you have all the witnesses you need to look at November 9th without all the the satanic garbage that Parminder and Tess put upon it. Ezekiel 1.1, there's a doubling for you. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, that would be 1989 to 2019, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month. What's the fourth day in the fifth day of the month? You're going to answer wrong, but go ahead. July 21st. July 21st. So you're saying July 21st, 1844. What was that? Midnight. midnight. So it's the midnight, the 30th year. But I'm going to say, no, it's not July 21st. What am I going to say, Brown? Yeah. What am I going to say? 49. It isn't 49. No, it isn't. You're reading it wrong. You need to read the verse 45. carefully. 45. In the history of the 45th president of the United States. That's there also. It's midnight, it's the July 21st, the fourth month, the fifth day, but it's also 45, the 45th president of the United States, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. Okay, so right there, that's the beginning of this reform movement in 1989 at midnight. 
It's also the end. And this is where the prophecies are opened up. And they're opened up about the 45th president of the United States. And, and these lines here are what are being opened up at that time. November 9th, uh, we're not there yet. It becomes a waymark simply by the chronology. The chronology up here of the 391 years carries into the chronology of Samuel Snow. And then it carries into the chronology of this history. The waymarks of this history possess the 391s as well. We're not there yet. But those 391s end on November 9th, 2019. So we got plenty of witnesses without taking all this elephant war, pyric war nonsense Amen. and social justice and corrupting it. Okay, so we're not doing that. Um, but you, I put in here, Daniel began to see September 7th, after we came out of hiding on September 7th, he began to see the places in the spirit of prophecy where it's mentioned. And on page one, you have Loughborough's two dreams. And it's marked as September 7th. We had a work to do. What's the work we have to do? We have to turn the train around. It's going on the wrong direction. September 7th and 8th, we enjoyed a precious season at Monterey with the brethren of Allegan County. Here we met Brother Loughborough, who had begun to feel the wrongs existing in Battle Creek and was mourning over the part he had acted in connection with these wrongs, which had injured the cause and brought cruel burdens upon us. By our request, he accompanied us to Battle Creek. But before we left Monterey, he related to us the following dream. Loughborough realizes that there's been an attack against Ellen White and James White, and he realizes that he's participated in that attack. Okay, so he's mourning the attack. So who's Ellen White and James White representing on September 7th, and who's Loughborough representing? You're Loughborough. I, I could be Loughborough, and everyone in this movement that's trying to be on the right side of it could be Loughborough. We've all participated in the wrongs. Right. So it, we've been against Ellen and James White. Who have we been against or undermining or whatever you want to express it? Here we met Brother Loughborough who had, been, had begun to fill the wrongs existing in Battle Creek and was mourning over the part he had acted in connection with these wrongs which had injured the cause and brought cruel burdens upon us. The us is James and Ellen White. And Loughborough and the church had brought cruel burdens upon James and Ellen White. Who are they at the end of the world on September 7th? Our movement? No, our movement's the one that's brought the cruel burdens. Ellen White would be the spirit of prophecy, wouldn't it? Yeah. We've... we've We've misunderstood, misapplied, or ignored the James spirit of prophecy. And James, you're going to say, is the Bible. I thought that would be the automatic response. Is everyone going to go with that? I'm going to argue no. Who's James White? What is the other element that has been undermined the by us? Or the the foundations, the pioneers. Was James White a pioneer? Yeah. Yeah, it's the foundations. There was an attack made upon the foundations and we let them get away with it. Yes, we or we participated in it, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now moving on. When, and I don't know this, I'm, I'm thinking Spanish in my head and my Spanish is a poquito, it's not real strong, but I think Mont is mountain and Ray is probably light. And they're on the mountain of light. But you got to check me on that. It might be some kind of fish. <laughs> All right. When brother and sister came to Monterey, September 7th, they requested me to accompany them to Battle Creek. Mountain King. Mountain King. They're on the, king, the King's Mountain. Yeah, Ray. What's the, the highway in California? Camino del Real. Del, del Real. The Camino. The King's Highway. It's not the same. Okay. I hesitated about going, thinking that it might be duty to still follow up the interest in Monterey and thinking, as I expressed them, that there was but little opposition to them in Battle Creek. This is Loughborough's dream. 
After praying over the matter several days, I retired one evening, evening anxiously soliciting the Lord for light in the matter. This is Loughborough's dream, but it's in the spirit of prophecy. Does that make it inspired or yes. just... It'd be, same as William it'd be the same as William Miller's dream. Right. I dreamed that I, with a number of other members of the Battle Creek Church, was on board a train of cars. The cars were low. I could hardly stand erect in them. They were ill-ventilated, having an odor as though they had not been ventilated for months. The road over which they were passing was very rough, and the cars shook about at a furious rate, sometimes causing our baggage to fall off and sometimes throwing off some of the passengers. We had to keep stopping to get on our passengers and baggage or repair the track. We seemed to work some time and make and to make little or no headway, we were indeed a sorry-looking set of travelers. All at, once we came, all at once we came to a turntable. What's a turntable? A turning point. Galilee. Large enough to take on the whole train. Brother and Sister White were standing there, and as I stepped off the train, they said, this train is going all wrong. It must be turned square about. So uh, before, before September 7th, Ellen and James White had left the train. They weren't on the train. They were waiting at the turning point for the train. And Allegan in Spanish is a plural of the word aligar, which means to gather. So they were gathered at the King's Mountain. Sorry. All right. That's good. That is good. Gathered at the King's Mountain, Allegan County. First line. Uh... All at once, we came to a turntable, large enough to take on the whole train. Brother and Sister White were standing there, and as I stepped off the train, they said, this train is going all wrong. It must be turned square about. How are you going to turn it square about? With the spirit of prophecy and the foundational understandings. I'm not trying to belittle the Bible, but the foundational understandings and the spirit of prophecy never disagree with the Bible. Um, they both laid hold of cranks that moved the machinery, turning the table, and tugged with all their might. Never did men work harder propelling a hand car than they did at cranks of the turntable. I stood and watched till I saw the train beginning to turn. When I spoke out and said it moves and laid hold to help them, I paid little attention to the train. We were so intent on performing our labor of turning the table. When we had accomplished this task, we looked up and the whole train was transformed. Instead of a low, ill-ventilated cars on which we had been riding, there were broad, high, well-mannered, well-ventilated cars with large, clear windows, the whole trimmed and gilded in a most splendid manner, more elegant, elegant than any palace or hotel car I ever saw. What does this mean? The Miller's dream there when the casket was transformed it's ten times. Ten times. Right. That's what that parallels at least. Okay, but uh, that that's correct. But what else? What happens when they get it turned around? Goes Different train. Different train. But goes back to the foundations. Yeah, they, they went back, but they become an ensign. They're 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 something everyone's going to look at. Never seen a car a train like this before. And they're able to stand up. They're just going to stand up straight, but it's been transformed. Low, they had a real low. This is um, this is talking about the work that begins at September 7th and when the work of turning the train around is finished, you're going to find that you're an ensign lifted up. That, that's my argument. When the foundations are rebuilt there and uh, finished being rebuilt by Elijah. July, July 18th, 2020. The fire comes down and yeah. gobbles it all up. It illuminates them. Sister White says in one place, the track was level, smooth, and firm. The train was filling up with passengers whose countenances were cheerful, cheerful and happy yet wore an expression of assurance and solemnity. All seemed to express the greatest satisfaction at the change which had been wrought and the greatest confidence in the successful passage of the train. Brother and Sister White were on board this time. Their countenance lit up with holy joy as the train was starting. I was so overjoyed that I awoke. When do you wake up? Midnight cry. With the impression on my mind that that dream referred to the church at Battle Creek and matters connected with the cause there. My mind was perfectly clear in regard to my duty to go to Battle Creek and lend a helping hand in the work there. Glad am I now that I've been here to see the blessing of the Lord accompanying the arduous labors of Brother and Sister White in setting things in order. Jan Loughborough. 
before, now this is Sister White, before we left Monterey, Brother Loughborough handed me the following account of another dream which he had about the time of the death of his wife. This was also a matter of encouragement to me. How many uh, dreams did Miller have? How many did Nebuchadnezzar have? How many did Joseph have? How many did Pharaoh have? How many did the two prisoners have? One each. All right. So what's it mean when a dream's doubled? This is midnight cry terminology, right? This is his second dream. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell the dream. Jeremiah 23, 28. One evening after meditating upon the afflictions of brother and sister White. This is the afflictions of brothers and sister, brother and sister White. Their connection with the work of the third angel's message and my own failure to stand by them in their affliction. And after trying to confess my wrong to the Lord and imploring his blessing upon brother and sister White, I retired to rest. I thought in my dream that I was in my native town at the foot of a long side hill. I spoke with considerable earnestness and said, Oh, that I might find the all-healing fountain. I thought a beautiful, well-dressed young man came along and said very pleasantly, This is an angel, no doubt, huh? I will conduct you to the spring. He led the way and I tried to follow. We went along the hillside, passing with much difficulty. How many? Three. Three. I'm saying 2014, December 17, 2016, and what is it? Sep October 13, 2018 are these three muddy streams. Boggy places. Passing with much difficulty three wet boggy places through which small streams of muddy water were flowing. It's not clear. None of it's clear. It's not clear and it's not easy to walk through there because it's a boggy, muddy place. I imagine your, your boots are getting sucked in and you have to pull them out. There was no way to cross these only by waiting. Having accomplished this, we came to the nice hard ground in a place where, the, where there was a jog in the bank and a large spring of pure sparkling water was boiling up. A large vat was placed there, very much like the plunge tub at the Health Institute at Battle Creek. Every time you see Brother and Sister White here at Battle Creek, it was, none of them were capitalized. I went through this morning and tried to capitalize them. You've seen I've missed some. So that, I'm just telling you that's why they're... You've got your hand up back there. Okay. A pipe was running from the spring into the end of the vat, and the water was overflowing at the other. The sun was shining brightly, and the water sparkled in its rays. As we approached the spring, the young man said nothing, but looked toward me and smiled with an expression of satisfaction and waved one hand toward the springs, as much as to say, don't you think that... Don't you think that is an all-healing spring? Quite a large company of persons with brother and sister white at their head came up to the spring on the opposite side from us. They all looked pleasant and cheerful, cheerful, yet a holy solemnity seemed to be on their countenances. Brother White seemed greatly improved in health and was cheerful and happy, but looked tired as though he'd been walking some distance. Sister White had a large cup in her hand, which she dipped into the spring, drinking of the water and then passing it to others. I thought the, that Brother White was addressing the company and saying to them, Now will you have a chance to see the effects of this water. He then drank, and it instantly revived him, as it did all the others who drank of it, causing a look of vigor and strength in their countenances. I thought that while Brother White was talking and take, taking now and then a draft of the water, he placed his hand on the side of the vat and plunged in three times. Every time he came up, he was stronger than before. But while he kept talking all but he kept talking all the while and exhorting others to come and bathe in the fountain, as he then called it, and drink of its healing stream. His voice, as well as that of Sister White, seemed melodious. I felt a spirit of rejoicing that I'd found the spring. Sister White was coming toward me with a cup of water for me to drink, but I was so rejoiced that I awoke before I drank of the water. Second witness to the fact that it all comes to when they wake up. When did they wake up? Midnight cry. Like William Miller. Like William Miller. That shout awoke me in Miller's dream. The Lord grant that I may drink largely of that water, for I believe that it is none other than that of which Christ spoke, which will spring up unto everlasting life. 
Therefore, the midnight cry message, what I'm saying is it comes in three steps, but those three steps are going to have corruption of the omega apostasy that you have to wade through. But when you get to the wake up time at the midnight cry, it's crystal clear. It's crystal clear, I guess. Yeah, crystal clear. And that's just ahead of us. Just ahead of us. Okay, so putting this in context, putting some things in context now. Rafi and Paniam, yes. <clears throat> if you're labeling um, Brother White as the pioneers or a foundational, as the foundations, so he had to go through three muddy puddles on one respect, but he had to plunge in three times to clean himself. Well, it doesn't say he had to. This no, is Lockborough but, walking. I know, but the foundations went through, based on our history that we're saying, three muddy puddles. puddles and so they needed three yep. dips to, okay. to clear that off of them. So the foundations had to be cleaned off. Could I don't be. know what that means. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Could be. I, I, I wondered what that meant. That could be it. Is that we have to be cleansed from every misconception that was associated with those three steps. So air that had been brought in. Three muds, three plunges. Cleaning them up. Okay. Thoughts. Rafi and Paniam came to light December 17th, 2016, and they're found in Daniel 11, 11 through 15. Okay, so I'm switching gears now. What I want, what I want to argue here or claim, however you express it, is that. The, uh, I believe, we put it in the record over and over, that this is the passage where the Lord removed his hand that paralleled the Lord removing his hand for the Millerite movement. Their movement's going to be repeated to the very letter. The Millerites had a foundational misunderstanding about the fullness of the year, and we had a foundational misunderstanding about the King of the South. We identified it strictly as the Soviet Union, not as Russia. When these verses came to light, verses 11 through 15, we realized that Russia was still the king of the south, still active. So, in verse 10 of Daniel 11, it says, But his sons shall be stirred up, and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. Verse 10 isn't raffia, but it's, it's setting the context for this passage. Verse 10, we identify the sons, uh, not from history, but we would identify the sons for our history as Reagan and Bush the first that are going to be marked as bringing down the king of the south. And when does the king of the south come to its conclusion in the time period of Reagan and Bush? November 9th, 1989, you would put with Reagan. Where, where, where would you put Bush the first? Close. When did the Soviet Union fully and completely end and Gorbachev go to work for the United Nations? December 25th, 1991. Okay, so November 9th, 1989, December 25th, those are two way marks. December 25th, not so long ago, within the past week or so, we went through the December 25th and connected them with the King of the South, with Russia. Soviet Union fully dissolved December 25th, 1991. Um, those sons, Reagan and Bush, are going to come against the King of the South, the Soviet Union, Russia, and they're going to overflow and pass through and if you keep your finger there, but go to verse 40. Speaking of the 1989 time period, even though it's stated differently, it's the identical words. In verse 40 it says, And at the time of the end, 1989, for our subject here, shall the king of the south push at him, or 1798, I'm sorry, part A. And the king of the north, 1989, time of the end, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, now this last phrase is identical. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. It's identical. Okay, so verse 10 
and verse 40 are describing a history that precedes the Battle of Raphia in verse 11, but a history that was fulfilled in verse 10 and also again in 1989-1991 time period. Um, not by Seleucus or Serenus or Antiochus the Great, but by Reagan and Bush in our history. But where do we go to get a second witness to this? I mean, this is two verses, but we're trying to get a verse, a second witness to uphold our claims about verse 10. Verse 10 said, One shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, identical Hebrew as verse 40. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. Where is our second witness? Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8. Go to Isaiah 8. In verse... Why am I going here? I need to explain why I'm doing this. Verse 8. Yeah, but we'll probably start in verse 5. The reason that I'm doing this now is I'm wanting us to see the connection between Rafi and Paneum in Daniel 11 and Isaiah 7 and onward. Because Isaiah 7 is the work that Isaiah does after he sees God's glory in the sanctuary in chapter 6. Why is that significant? Because Sister White speaks about the visions of Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. And Sister White teaches repeatedly that the visions of John are the same visions as Daniel. Right? The same line of prophecy that's taken up in the Revelation as in the book of Daniel. So when Sister White speaks about the visions of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and John, she's also saying the visions of Daniel. So we see a passage in Daniel that is the passage where the Lord removes His hand from a foundational understanding. And in the verses that allow us to come to understand this truth, it takes us to the vision of Isaiah, and you have, to, you have to see this connection. The vision of Isaiah is going to even open broader. Okay, so let's start in verse 5 of Isaiah 8. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, Forasmuch as this people refuses the waters of Shiloh. Okay, you have to see this. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, Forasmuch as this people refuses the waters of Shiloh, that go softly and rejoice in Rezin and Remaliah's son. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah and he shall, and this is the identical Hebrew of verse 10 and verse 40. He shall overflow and go over. Of those three verses, in the English, it's different in each verse, but in the Hebrew, it's identical. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. Why is that important? If you still have your finger in Revelation or Daniel 10, 11, verse 10, when he overflows and passes through in verse 10, which is typifying verse 40, it says, And overflow and pass through, then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. Even supplies, so just to his fortress. He just, what's his fortress? The capital, the capital his castle, his stronghold. stronghold, his neck. Yeah. Okay, so... You're now, you, now you got a witness from verse 10 of Daniel 11 that isn't just connecting with the overflow and pass through. Now it's giving you the justification for recognizing 
that when we used to teach that the Soviet Union was the king of the south and in 1989-91 it collapsed and the king of the south was no longer in history, that it moved to the United Nations, we were wrong because we didn't see that it went up to his fortress and stopped. It went up to his neck and stopped. And the, it went to Russia. The Soviet Union was taken away, but it just, the head of Russia, how, why am I saying the head? How do you prove that? Okay, you go in this same vision. Remember, there's no chapter divisions in the writing of Isaiah. Go to chapter 7, verse 8. The head of Syria is Damascus. What's Syria? It's a country. What's Damascus? It's the capital city. The head of Arkansas is Little Rock. And the head of Little Rock is, I don't know who the governor is. Asa Hutchinson is the governor? Okay. So the head of Arkansas is Little Rock, and the head of... Little Rock is Asa Hutchinson. For some reason, Isaiah is making sure we understand what the head is. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be, Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. So at the very point where Isaiah is making sure that we understand what the head is, and why do we need to know what the head is? Because in chapter 8, the king of the north, the king of Assyria, is going to come up to the neck. And why do we have to know that? Because in chapter 11 of Daniel, verse 10, the Lord's going to remove his hand so we can see that the king of the south is Russia, not the Soviet Union, so that end time prophecy will come into clarity. This is big stuff. But in order for him to make sure we understand what it means that he comes to his neck in Isaiah 8, he's got to tell us what the head is. So in the very verse where he begins to teach us what the head is, what does he also include? The 2520. The 65 years of the 2520, which is the starting point, and don't miss it, the 65 years, which is the starting point for the 2520 when you're going to lay it out on lines to teach the people, okay? But verse 9, he's going to give you a second witness. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. But that, that's just Isaiah thrown in. <laughs> if, you, if you walk past this truth, you're dead. What, is, it, is it 1 Chronicles 20.20? 20, 20? What? 2 Chronicles? 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. Yeah. 20, 20. Okay, let's go there. I mean, if, it, you can't read that verse without thinking of 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. I don't think. No. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Okay. So, what is that? 220. <laughs> 220. Okay. And it's a doubling. And it's a doubling. It's a, it's a, a doubling of 2020, but it's 2020, February. Oh, anyway, okay. So, go back to Isaiah. Also alluding to the year 2020. Oh, yeah, also you're alluding to the year 2020. A lot of, yeah. a lot of stuff in there. A doubling, the year 2020, and the 220. And what's the 220? Restoration. Restoration. Okay, but back to Isaiah 8. Pardon me? It also takes us to Deuteronomy 18 and 18. Okay, from 2020 we go to Deuteronomy 18 18. Which is verse 19, which says, And it shall come to pass that whoever will not hearken unto my words... When he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. 
Same thing. So believe in the Lord God and believe in His prophets. And Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is the promise He's going to raise up a prophet. And in 18.18 18, He raises up Miller. And verse 19 says, And it shall come to pass that whoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. And, and it's even more direct when you carry this into the book of Acts, when it's fulfilled. You, you reject this message, you die. So, but back to Isaiah 8. Yes, Isaiah 8. Yeah, it is. He says it's a doubling too. It's 8-8. Eight, 8-8 eight. Eight, eight is a doubling also. That's right. That's right. Um, and in, in Daniel 11, where we began, Raphia is 11-11. If, if we're looking for those kind of things. And of course we are. But what I'm trying to show us here, so I don't lose you, is I'm trying to show you the connection between certain passages of Scripture and each other. But the connection that's being made is the connection of the midnight cry message. The midnight cry message, the message of Raphi and Paneum. That's where we're starting. We're starting with verse 10 leading into Raphi and Paneum showing how the Lord removed His hand so that we could see Russia, but it took us to Isaiah 7 and 8, Isaiah 6, 7 and 8 for our second witnesses, but within our second witnesses, it opens up the 2520 as well, but you had your hand back there? Oh, wait. But in verse 1 of chapter 8, okay, of Isaiah, Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Mayor Shalahashbash. Okay, now, what's that? If you go to Isaiah 8.18, it says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel for the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Okay, so... There's a nice theme that you have to see in there. There's another son of Isaiah in this passage. Who's the other son? Shirjashub. Shirjashub is in the previous chapter, I believe, um, in chapter 7, verse 3. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shirjashub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. So what does Shir Jashub mean? Remnant a remnant shall return. What's Mayor Shalahashbaz mean? In making speed to despoil, he hasteneth the prey, or make speed. I just have to make haste for simple. But disregarding what Shir Jashub and Mayor Shalahashbaz, what it contributes to Isaiah's story, I just want you to see principle here. It's giving you two witnesses, and verse 18 says that the sons are, are for signs. It's giving you two wit witnesses that sons, the names of the sons, are signs. How does it read it in verse 18? For and for wonders in Israel. Okay, so there's a principle there that we can hold on to. And in chapter 8... Back to chapter 8 of Isaiah, in verse 5, which we've already read, it says, The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuses the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in resin and Re Remaleah's son, now, for, now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, and he shall come up over all his banks and go over all his banks. So what? Yep. Yeah, but what I want you to see is this. Let me erase something here. I'm wanting to show the connection between these lines of these themes in Bible prophecy, they're all part of the midnight cry message. And at this point, I'm arguing that in Ezekiel 1.1, in the 30th year at midnight, 
the visions opened up to Ezekiel. Therefore, the visions opened up to Ezekiel, Isaiah, John, and Daniel at midnight, November 9th, 2019. And that for Isaiah, that was chapter 6. And he sees the glory of the Lord. And he hear, Isaiah is humbled in the dust. He says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah volunteers to be sent. And then in chapter 7, we see him in an interaction with Ahaz. And I'm saying that the pool of Shiloh here is what Ahaz and God's people are rejecting. And because they reject that water, they get the water of Euphrates. Okay, they get the Sunday law. They get the mark of the beast. So Shiloh, at one level, would be the seal of God, as, in contrast with the river Euphrates, the mark of the beast. But I'm arguing that Shiloh, that water, is the water of the latter rain. It's the midnight cry message. Okay. And so, let me put this up here. I'm marking the arrival of the third mud puddle, October 13th, 2018. Okay, now this is... Tess grabbed a couple truths about November 9th and put them on this board, and we all saw it, and that board. But then Theodore added a second witness to November 9th, and November 9th was established, but it was established with a bunch of mud, okay, because it had all of those predictions that were false attached to it. But nevertheless, we marked it here, okay? And from November 9th, or from October 13th, until December 25th, 2021, is how many days? Seven hundred and seventy-seven days. Right? You taking my word for it? Okay. Two hundred and fifty-two days after here, on yeah, you, you shouldn't have took my word for it, because that's wrong. Okay, this is when the message came. It's part of the story, but I'm not dealing with that part. I'm sorry if you wrote something in your, your uh, paper that you had to erase. This is November 9th, 2019. From 2019, November 9th, to December 25th is 777 days. Okay. 252 days after this takes you to where? July, July 18th, 2020. What day of the week did this take place on? The Sabbath. Okay. What day of the week does this take place on? Sabbath. What day of the week does this take place on? Okay. That's a, another witness to 777. You've got 777 days. And uh, I don't want to put all this on here because it's, it's more than I... The Italian camp meeting and stuff, it's, it's further than I want to go. But where I want to go is back here. And say that 
in Genesis, Lamech, let's go there. Go to Genesis, is it five or six? Let's go to the genealogies that begin with, it's in chapter five. Let's go to verse, Okay, um, let's start with verse 21. And Enoch lived. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and beget Methuselah. How many years? Sixty-five. What's sixty-five? It's the prophecy of the 2520, okay? No accidents here. If, it, if, the, if there's no other characteristics associated with it that make that claim, then, then it's a false claim. But there is, we'll show them to you. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters, and all the days of, of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lamech. How long did he live? 187. And he begot, he begot Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech 782 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And Lamech lived... 182 years and beget a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This same, same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he beget Noah 500 and 590 and five years and beget sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were how many? 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old when he died. And Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So I'm saying in this history here, this 77, I'm going to put Lamech here as a symbol of this history, leading to Noah. Just leading to Noah. He's the next guy. I'm not saying that the, the timing's going to lock. Uh, but what's Noah? Symbol of the closed door, isn't he? Okay. What is this on other witnesses? This is the Sunday law. Is there a closed door at the Sunday law? Okay, so to March, let me make sure I get this right, from November 9th, if from here to here we have 252 days. Larry was teaching us on Sabbath about chiastic structures. Yes? So if we go back 252 days, we get to to March. Twenty nineteen. And 19? November. I think so. Eighteen. Is it eighteen? You got two thousand eighteen in the middle of those. Where? I don't need that on there. Okay, I don't, I don't need that at this point. Six May. Is 65 days. From here to here. Is 252 days. And from here to here is 187 days. Where did we see the 187? Pardon me? When Methuselah begat Lamech, he was 187. Yeah. Okay, so... Verse 25. So right here is where Lamech would be born. And he, he's born when... 
Methuselah is 170, 87 years old. And how old was Enoch when he begat Methuselah? 65. Are you seeing it? This 65, therefore, is Enoch. This 187 is Methuselah. And it takes us to this history of Lamech. Which one was 187? Methuselah. It's in verse 25. Yeah. And Methuselah oh, lived yeah. okay. an 180 and seven years and begat, begat Lamech. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Lamech's name means in Hebrew. Why do we care about what his name means? Just yeah. Go ahead. What's it mean? What's it mean? It means to Amen. make low. To make low? Okay, but what? Wild man. Wild man. Who, who's the wild man in scripture? Islam. Genesis 16, 12. But I ask you, why do we care about what his name is? Because in Isaiah 7 and 8, on two witnesses, Shir Jashub and Meir Shalahashbaz, in verse 18, the Lord tells us that Isaiah's sons are given to him for signs and wonders. And it's in that very passage where we see this prophecy of 65 years. Yes? Everyone with me? And here, with Methuselah, what does his name mean? It means when he dies, this will come. But if you really get down to the root of it, it means Shiloh in the Old Testament or Siloam in the New Testament. And if you really get down to the root of it, It means a missile that is sent. Also means to shoot forth. To shoot forth. Okay, so in this history, from the 2nd of March onward, marching to November 9th, we have the beginning of the Bible right at the end of the world. Jesus has taken Genesis chapter 5. He's illustrating the end of the world, but he's connected Isaiah 7 and 8, the very message that Isaiah gets when he sees the glory of the Lord. But in that very message where Isaiah is showing that Shiloh is the latter rain message that is rejected by God's people that brings them the mark of the beast, in that very message, we have the connection to what? To Raphi and Paneum, which is the message the Lord removed his hand from on December 17th, 2016. What are you marking May 6th, 2019 as? Nothing. Oh, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know on this. the start this. of Ramadan. It was the start of Ramadan there. Was it? Yeah, that's what it says here online. I don't know what that means. Uh, uh, in oh. that year? It was also the 126th day of the year. Yeah, in that year it's the start of Ramadan. Okay, so I, I, I wasn't worried about that. What am I worried about? What I'm worried about in this presentation... What, what are you marking? Just no, what is cut it? across what is March because second or March It's or the May 65 second. years that are marked concerning Enoch, was 65 years old. Yes, but wouldn't you want to know the... Wouldn't you want yeah, to know you would want to know. Mark? You'd want to know. But that's not... I, and I don't mind knowing. Okay, I'm going to put Ramadan up there, although I, I'm certain I can't spell it correctly. And it's 126 days, the 126th day, the day of the year in the Islamic calendar or in, in this Gregorian calendar? Just on the website, so I'd have to check. Yeah, be Gregorian, probably. On that definition of Methuselah, one of the Wait a second. Wait a second. Hold your thought. What I'm trying to show here isn't this. What I'm trying to show is that this truth that of Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah that's in Genesis 
is connected with the message of Isaiah 7 and 8, which is connected with the message of Raphia and Paneum. They're all part of the midnight cry message, and there are direct connections. That's what I want us to see here. That's, that's my premise. A little tidbit. That, that part of that uh, definition of, of Methuselah, yes, is missile, but it's missile of attack. You want missile of attack. That is sent. Yes. Wow. Okay, so, so if this be part of the midnight cry message, and it is that we were to see when the Lord removes his hand in December of 2016, then it's saying in this history, the message will include a warning message represented by Shiloh, which is the same root word as Methuselah. Okay? You could call Methuselah Shiloh if you meant him, or Siloam. All right, same, same root word. Our message will be about the 65 years that starts the 2520. And it will include the story of Enoch, because in this history, who begins this history? Enoch. And when you get down here to the Sunday Law, those people that have accepted and proclaimed this message, who are they? They're the 144,000, and who are they going to be living like? Enoch. Enoch. Okay, he illustrates the end from the beginning. But down here, the next patriarch is Noah, where the door closes, at the Sunday Law. But this 777 history is the history of who? It's a history of Lamech. But it's a history of... 144,000. I mean, it implies Islam. Okay, I, I will, if I can turn right to it. And I think I just did. I'll read a couple things and we'll bring this to a close. And this is a, uh, this is coming primarily from Sunday Keepers, but it doesn't matter. It's just addition. And the reason that I wanted to get to this point and I didn't get far enough along is I want to tell you that when we go into the Desire of Ages to read about Caesarea Philippi, which is Paneum, because we've got to do that in the next presentation, what chapter is it? No way. <laughs> no way. It's chapter 45. Okay, it's chapter 45. I'm saying that this is the history of the 45th president of the United States. Chapter 45 of what? The Desire of Ages. Oh, Desire of Ages. I was thinking, okay, five. Right, come on. Okay, let me read a few things. Um, Donald Trump won the presidential election on the same day, the 8th of November, 2016, as the Israeli, Israeli Prime Minister Benton, Benjamin Netanyahu's seventh year, seventh month, seventh day in office. So Netanyahu was in, when he won, won the election, and he won the erect, uh, erection, he won the election on November 8th. But when did he really, when did they finish the counting? November 9th, okay. But on November 8th, Netanyahu is in his seventh year, seventh month, seventh day in office. Donald Trump was born 700 days before Israel declared independence. Therefore, 777 days after Trump's birth, the modern nation of Israel was 77 days old. The opening ceremony for the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem started at 4 p.m. 14 May 2018 70 years to the hour that Israel first that Israel's first would-be Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion stood up to read out the Israeli Declaration of Independence on May 14 1948 the embassy's opening ceremony was 700 days after Donald Trump's 70th birthday on his first full day in office, the 21st of January, 2017, 
Donald Trump was exactly 70 years, seven months, and seven days old. This was the rabbinic Hebrew year 5777. He beat Hillary Clinton by 77 electoral votes. 19 December 2019. There were seven faithless electors. Two voted against Donald Trump, while five others voted against Hillary Clinton. Talking about the electoral process now. Um, and I'm glancing through here just to see the seven, seven, sevens. That's, that's good. I'm saying this history here begins the history of Donald Trump. And that Donald Trump is symboled by 777. And this history is symbolized by Lamech. And this history has three primary waymarks. That's a seven Sabbath, a seven Sabbath, a seven Sabbath. But when you get to here, this is where 777 joins 666. And when you add seven and six together, you end up with 13, 13, 13, which is this threefold rebellion that takes place at the Sunday Law here. So a lot of things you can derive from this. But all I'm wanting to do now is hopefully, and I'm not finished, I'll have to do it in the next presentation, show the connection between Raphia and Paneum in Daniel 11 and Isaiah 6 and onward and the opening of the temple and, Isaiah, or, and Ezekiel's opening of the temple and Genesis, the beginning of the scriptures, before we go into the second witness for Palmoni. Palmoni, Daniel 813, second witness, I'm going to claim, is Matthew 16, and we'll take that up next time, Lord willing. And this stuff, the, the, it, it can't be an accident. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, it appears we're at the very end of time, that uh, the events of the events that we've looked forward to for many years are now taking place, are beginning to unfold, and that Pandora's box has been opened, uh, that the economic collapse that you have spoken about through Sister White to where the people in the United States cry out for a Sunday law in order to return to temporal prosperity has arrived. Um, we wish that you'd give us the power and discernment to be about our business of carrying this message, bringing our families into agreement before Noah arrives, before the door closes. We thank you for the light that you're sharing. We ask that the work that we're doing to put this out on planet Earth would be blessed by you, and we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.